uh, make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. I'll pass over to Dr. Furman. Introduce you first. All right. I'm thrilled to per, um, to um, call to the podium Ms. Courtney Simon. She is going to introduce the Dyslexia Task Force presentation, and then we will have the uh, presenters come and share their findings. Good afternoon, esteemed board members, Superintendent Dr. Furman, City Schools of Decatur staff, family, and community friends. My name is Courtney Simon, and I provide instructional support for our CSD K-12 learning community. I have the privilege to represent and present an intelligent, insightful, resourceful group of CSD stakeholders that formulated and fueled the first City Schools of Decatur Dyslexia Task Force. According to the International Dyslexia Association, the definition of dyslexia is a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin. It is, categor it is categorized by difficulties with accurate and or fluid word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. These difficulties difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language that is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities and the provision of effective classroom instruction. Secondary consequences may include problems in reading comprehension and reduced reading experience that we can impede growth of vocabulary and background knowledge. As of May 2019, Governor Kemp signed Senate Bill 48 into law. SB 48 provides for identification of and support of students in pre-kindergarten through second grade with dyslexia. The city schools of Decatur was selected to be one out of seven districts selected to participate in the pilot in 2019-20. We are now in our third and final year of implementation. In 2024-25, statewide dyslexia screening will be a mandate. Yesterday, the City Schools of Decatur had the honor of hosting the Griffin Spalding County Schools and Clayton County School District, MTSS, and Literacy Instructional Leaders yesterday for the first time during our CSD dyslexia collaboration. It was very well received, but our practices will continue to evolve for the good of our students and teachers. In the fall of 2022, in response to the city schools of Decatur stakeholders in need for a deeper understanding of CSD's progress as a Georgia dyslexia pilot district, what it means for a student to be identified with characteristics of dyslexia, how CSD supports students with characteristics of dyslexia and struggling students, how can CSD improve our dyslexia screening process to align with the intent outlined in SB 48, and what information and resources do parents need if they have concerns with their child's ability to read. The superintendent with all these requests called for a dyslexia task, task force to be formed. The district member criteria included CSC staff who can be decision makers, have expertise in the area of effective instruction, MTSS, and SPED eligibility requirements. The community parent criteria included members of the community with knowledge of dyslexia and or a personal experience with a child exhibiting characteristics of dyslexia. The task force, task force member, Jennifer Lindstrom, the Doe Dyslexia Statewide Coordinator, Dr. Superintendent, Courtney Simon, Director of ELA and Social Studies, Dr. Gail Hardwick, District Reading Coach, Dr. Carla Zissuk, District Reading Coach, 
Mr. Benjamin Nabel, Coordinator of Section 5 in School Psychology, Dr. Holly Brookins, Principal of Glenwood Elementary School, Ms. Christine Knox, Principal of Westchester Elementary School, Mr. Frank DeFilippio, Special Education Coordinator, then EIP teacher at the Tally Elementary School, Ms. Brooke Reynolds, a third grade teacher at the Tally Street Upper Elementary School, Ms. Laura Bowman, one of our CSD parents, Ms. Lori Garrett, another CSD parent, Ms. Megan Swingle, a CSD parent, Ms. Patty, Patty Fornwalt, a CSD parent, and Sarah Wyman, a CSD parent. We met for four uh, sessions officially. We broke up into three work groups, which we, we will address today. And we met throughout the year in between our formalized meetings. And the task force roles, myself and Dr. Brookins were the facilitators. Ms. Garrett was our secretary. Ms. Jemison was our timekeeper. Um, our open circle facilitator was Mr. Nabel. And the board reporters who will present to you our findings today will be Ben, Gail, Carla, and Patty. Thank you. The purpose of the CSC Dyslexia Task Force mission. And this is based on a charter that we established at the very beginning of our work. Support CSC in building an informed and educated school community that proactively identifies struggling readers and delivers sustainable, equitable, and proven effective reading instruction for all students, including those who are identified as having characteristics of dyslexia and or struggling readers to become skilled, lifelong readers. Next, please. The first work group is titled the Dyslexia Task Force Screening Process. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Simon, for an amazing introduction. Uh, that was great. Um, my name is Ben Knabel. This is Gail Hardwick. Um, and we were happy to be a part of this um, work group looking at the task force screening process. Um, I think we were both humbled to be a part of this group. There were many, many very knowledgeable people on this group, um, and put, we put all our minds together to come up with some best solutions. Um, I was very humbled, but sometimes I feel like I'm the best uh, representative, representative for this group because I say my last name is the dyslexia screener. <laughs> if you say my last name correctly, that means you do have dyslexia. So um, you don't have dyslexia because you said navel and not navel. So I just wanted to kind of start with that. So what we're going to do first is we're just going to go over our current screening process. So everybody's kind of aware of what we're doing right now to look for dyslexia? So our current universal screening procedures require different assessments at different grade levels, um, which impacts the ability to effectively assess all areas of state building. The math, is, the math reading growth that we give is not specific enough to measure all areas of State Bill 48. So our foundational reading skills are only one in of the five components of literacy assessed by MAP growth reading. And if we look at this chart right here, what we'll notice is kindergarten, first, and second grade, we have the MAP reading growth as well as Acadian. So we have that in K1 and 2. However, it changes in third grade because we have MAP reading as well, but we don't have Acadian in third grade. So the universal screener is age web. Okay, so it's different for both of those. And with our screening process, if students, this is the way it is now, right? So with students who um, score below the 20th percentile in math reading, and they score below benchmark in Acadian, depending on what time of year it is, that's when the students then go to um, get the KTE, KTEA3, and they're assessed with that. Um, so this is where we are right now. These are our reading procedures right now. Clarifying question, when we say map reading here, we don't mean map reading fluency, we're meaning map reading, reading growth. growth. That is what the students are taking right now, okay. yes. <clears throat> All right. 
So uh, we're going to be going on over a lot of different um, vocabulary, language, different assessments. I know that's a lot of information. So I think you all have a packet you can familiar yourself with moving forward. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and stop us because sometimes we get going and we feel like everybody knows what we're talking about and their acronyms and different concepts. Um, so just stop us if you need more help. Um, what we really try to do is model our screening process off the mandate of State Bill 48. We were lucky because we already had a team that went through State Bill 48 and tried to come up with our And what we were mandated to look at were these um, <clears throat> six areas. We, wanted to, uh, we have to have a screening process that looks at phonological and phonemic awareness, sound symbol recognition, or to link the sound to <laughs> alphabetic knowledge, decoding skills, rapid naming, how quickly you're able to identify learned literacy information, or any learned information for that matter, and then encoding skills, which is basically spelling. So that's what State Bill 48 is mandating for us to look at. And so to uh, the question we just had, we did look at math, and we wanted to see if math was really focused on these areas. And what we found was is that, I'm not gonna go into this in too much depth, but when we looked at math growth, it had some of the foundational pieces, but it didn't look specifically at those six areas that SB48 um, really wants us to look at more closely. And so that's one of the findings kind of when we went through this group that helps us inform some of our decision making. And then we also looked at Acadians. So that was our other measure. And what we found was Acadians did look a little more closely at some of these areas, but we didn't use it in third. Um, we had to switch to Ames Web in third grade. And we also needed to um, look a little bit closer at pieces like rapid automated naming, which is how quickly you can uh, name numbers and letters, which you see isn't there. So that's something else we found about um, Acadians, what we were, were currently using. Um, this is Ames Web. And so what we see with Ames Web, when we switched to third grade, we were able to get an oral reading fluent, but then we don't have the other areas as close. So again, I think the main point is, is we're kind of looking at different measures to look at different concepts across different grade levels, which could um, give us different results for that matter. Okay, so in terms of our, our findings, we did notice that, the, like we said, the current screening procedures require different assessments at different grade levels in attempt to meet all areas of the screening mandate. Even within that attempt, we were still missing certain pieces, like we talked about, the math growth uh, measure, not looking at rapid automated naming, and really not looking at the foundational skills at a granular level. If we're looking at K2, we really want to be looking um, closely at those graphene, phoneme, phonological awareness pieces. Um, we also found that students must score below benchmark on two universal screeners before we get the qualified KTA3 dyslexia screener. So the Senate Bill 48 mandates that we have a, a, a dyslexia screener after we find kids that are at risk. And what we're saying is, is that we have to have two measures of universal screening before we even get to that dyslexia screener. Our two measures, we weren't confident that we're looking at all um, areas of State Bill 48. So we had to reevaluate, okay, how can we fill in these pieces? Um, and then finally, our, our assessment on map growth reading does not effectively measure all of the foundational reading skills that is stated in Senate Bill 48, which I already talked about. Uh, current and continuing on with those findings, um, oral reading fluency is not universally screened for all students unless they score below the cutoff risk of math growth reading. So when we get to third grade, we weren't even looking at kids in oral reading fluency unless they met the cutoff score for math, which you've already established that math maybe doesn't look at every area. So that was another hole for us that we could be missing children because if they aren't scoring low enough in math, we're then we're not, we're not even getting a chance to look at their oral reading. Um, we already talked about math. And then uh, this is another piece we had to really examine closely is that we could be missing some students because our universal screening cutoff um, for being below benchmark was 20th percentile. Um, so you had to be below the 20th percentile to meet that cutoff. Whereas we do have high achieving students that could have dyslexia that could be scoring above the 20th percentile. And if, it, if they're not below the 20th percentile, then they wouldn't screen forward for us to look at on the KTA3 measurement. So we, we had to really think about, you know, these, these cutoff scores, are they appropriate? And not only does the 20th percentile go for MAP, we have to have another screener on top of that. So you have to be below 20th percentile MAP, and you have to screen again low on another screener before we get to the KT. So that could really, some of our higher achieving students have had early intervention. They may not be getting that cutoff at the 20th percentile. 
earlier grades. Um, okay. So these are sort of our recommendations coming from that, is that we really need to find a universal screener that comprehensively meets all areas of SB 48, which is tricky. We haven't had one, we haven't had a recommendation from the state, and we're still waiting on that. So we do have to look and do our own research about these screeners that are out there that can look at every area granularly. Uh, we also, we believe that students not need, do not need to have a, be, um, a below benchmark score on both universal screeners to qualify for the, the dyslexia screener test. So, for example, if you're low on one, but you're above grade long uh, benchmark on the other, perhaps we can still go forward with the um, dyslexia screener. The current, uh, we also looked at uh, map reading fluency, and they have a dyslexia screener in their testing, and that could be a sustainable add-on for a universal screener, and uh, that screener goes uh, up to K8. So, the dyslexia screener is K3, which would still be within the mandate of State, state Bill 48. But we also want to think about after third grade, what are we doing for our students, right? Kids don't magically not become dyslexic after third grade. Um, although the state bill says up to third grade, best practices would be for us to continue to look for children who may show signs. So if we were to switch to something like fluency, we could get higher than th third grade as well. Uh, the next piece we also considered was looking at our multi-tiered system of support as a way of also looking at a screener. Um, we just have these two cutoff scores we're looking at. We have children who are receiving intervention. They're in Tier 2, they're in Tier 3, and they may not be showing progress. However, they may have met that benchmark score and they didn't get screened. So we need to um, loop in and layer in perhaps another measure, uh, another benchmark or another um, point of decision-making after six to eight weeks to say, hey, maybe this child does have dyslexia and that's why they're progressing at a slower rate or that's why they need Tier 3. So we also want to make sure that we're considering the response to intervention when we're screening for dyslexia. Um, that's kind of what I said down here, response to intervention. And we really want to focus on um, the progress monitoring in that specific skill area and really timely transition between tiers. Because it isn't just about the dyslex a dyslexic diagnosis or the characteristics of dyslexia. It's about the skills they're building. So if we're screening in these six different areas, and we really want to make sure when we're in this multi-tier system of support, and we're monitoring progress in those skill areas, we're making timely decisions. Because if you're not intervening and you're not making decisions, then um, the child isn't going to benefit from you. So we want to make sure that's a, really a piece of this, along with the screening. Um, when you mentioned that, that we have to, we don't currently have a universal screener, we're going to need to do our own research since the state isn't recommending. Mm -hmm. Have we done our own research on the magnitude screener? Is that you're proposing that as a potential universal screener that meets all those requirements? Yeah, that was the recommendation from our work group. So we went and looked at it. Um, we looked at what it looks at. We looked at the grade levels, whether it meets the SB 48 mandates, and we found that it, it, it's a good screener that can meet all those areas. Okay. Specifically with the rapid naming section. So rapid naming is how quickly kids can um, uh, say letters or numbers or pictures. And this has a component to where, you know, a child will wear earphones and they'll read into the earphones and they'll actually read off of the screen, which has been cumbersome for us because that's, a, that's an individually administered piece. You have to sit and monitor the child. So that particular test will provide um, more sustainability for us to screen large amounts of children. And would that be an would they continue to do MAP growth, continue to do Acadians, but you just wouldn't use those as a screening for dyslexia and there would be an additional map uh, reading fluency and dyslexia that they would take that would add to the screen. In terms of operationalizing it, how do you? Right, do you want to go ahead? Well, I don't mean if I'm jumping in. No, it's so. not. No, no, you're, you're, right, we're getting right there. here. That's where we're getting right here when we talk about what you just asked. Um, so for K3, these are the recommend, these are what we recommend right here, is for to continue with the Cadians beginning, middle, and end of the year for all students, like a 10 minute assessment. Um, we feel that's very valid. And then if we did the math reading fluency dyslexia screener, that's what you're talking about, it would be once per term. Um, and it's like a 20 minute assessment. So, you know, just like Ben said, like it would be the headphones for the younger ones. It would be kind of like that. Um, and then further screening with the KTA3 as well. Now, with the one question I think you were asking is, would they still do math reading growth? I think that was your question. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And the reason we don't know yet, because that's yeah. part of the universal screening that we have to do just for overall. So nice. this is this is universal screening just for dyslexia. There's other universal screeners we have to administer at least twice a year um, for other MTSS. We will say that we that we bounce that idea around because there are other components in math growth kids that specifically gift in testing, right? Okay. So we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater for that sure. reason. But um, that might not be appropriate until the older grades. If we have a, a screener that goes K3, that looks at more of the granular skills of reading, and then after third grade, if you look at the more broader sense of language arts pieces in, in, in the math test, that might be an approach, but we have to look closer at that. That once per year for the reading fluency, is there a recommended window within the year? Or, I mean, does it differ if you're doing it at the very beginning versus the end? Once per term. That's what I meant. I'm sorry. Term. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, you know, that's a good question. I can get an exact answer for you. But what I can tell you is the map is a, um, a test that adjusts to the skill level. So if you were to give it to the beginning of the year, it's going to adjust to what it expects the child to know at the beginning of first grade versus what it expects the child to know at the end of first grade. So it should catch, in theory, that um, progress throughout the year. Right. And NWEA does provide guidance on how, what time of year. You know, and that's why we have those windows. It'll say, like, this is the testing window this time of year. And so that's the NWEA guidance. That's what we follow when we do our math testing. And one other thing I will say is that these, these screeners are kind of new, like the KTA3 screener, you know, with this dyslexia legislation that's come out. Um, there's been a lot of new screeners that come out that don't really have a lot of the same research behind them. The KTA has, has quite some research behind it because it's been around for a while. But what's nice is if you have two qualified dyslexia screeners, because you have the map reading fluency dyslexia screener and the KTA, you're, you're, yet, you're less susceptible to false positives because then you have two measures looking specifically at dyslexia rather than two measures that are broad measures of reading and then one measure looking at dyslexia. You have kids who may, may have not been to school or don't have the same schooling or move in or those sorts of pieces that could impact um, universal screenings like Acadians or MAP because they're more instructional based rather than We also talked about, remember we said the MAP reading fluency goes up through eighth grade, so we were thinking as, you know, this is recommended that maybe we give it to everybody up through eighth grade and that's still that 10 minute assessment so that we can catch those students that may not have had these assessments, you know, throughout schooling, or they might just have come to our district or something like that. Mm -hmm. So this is just a, a table of the recommended process. We kind of already talked through it, but, you know, we do have K3. We're going to do a recommendation of the Acadians, because that's still looking at those granular skills, those phonological awareness skills, the adding the math dyslexia screener, so you get a fluency score and the rapid automated naming. Um, and then we also want to add in the layered MTSS screener, where if you're receiving tier two or tier three support for six to eight weeks, looking at the progress monitoring, and if you're not making progress, use that as also a reason to go forward in the dyslexia screener. What are the benchmarks on the right side? So it says the low benchmark is the benchmark for the test itself, or is the benchmark for something else? Uh, so Let's just focus on like the second box, KTA. So yeah. you remain below the benchmark after six to eight weeks specific support. What's the benchmark that they're below to continue that? Sure. So typically if we're doing tier two or tier three, we're progress monitoring on a curriculum-based measurement that has norms associated with it. So there should be a benchmark like by the middle of the school year, you should be reading like 20 words per minute or something like that, or you're able to identify 30 correct letter sounds. So if you're below that benchmark on that specific skill, and then we recommend maybe doing a dyslexia. Oh, so phonetic awareness mm -hmm. benchmark is created as a result, and then we continue to monitor. Mm -hmm. And if students don't achieve those benchmarks, we continue with intervention. Is that the status quo, or that's just the recommendation? Uh, the status quo is to continue with intervention. The recommendation is to do the screener to see if dyslexia, characteristics of dyslexia could be could be there. Because remember, right now we're using the MAP scores and the Cadians. And when you have kids in kindergarten and in first grade, um, I would say the MAP specificity of identifying kids who are well below grade level isn't quite as specific because um, it's, a, it's a large national sample, right? So, you know, you, you, to get below the 20th percentile as a first grader, um, you, you might, you know, you might miss kids that have the skills at the 40th percentile, but they might need intervention. So the recommendation is not how we respond, 
but it's one of either, and then add in KTEA if one of either. Uh, so one of either with the, with the screeners, yeah. and then also with the MTSS, okay. add the KTEA as a possibility. And I think that's something we've heard from feedback too from parents is, is that like, okay, my child didn't qualify for the dyslexia screener. Mm -hmm. I, I want them screened. Is there another option for it? And we didn't really have anything. So this would be another pathway to get this out of just the universal screeners. How are you deciding which kids qualify for this monitoring period? Which ones are the best ones with these? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so th they typically are caught through our universal screeners. They just don't have to be caught by both. So there are cases where you get caught for intervention, you're in intervention, but then you never get screened. So this would take care of, of that piece. And if there's trends that they every single time and bounce around, maybe they've had maps that are here, here, but they don't, they don't keep capturing both, then would you see that trend and then say, okay, it's that would be the theory with this. So that's the idea with this. And I think the other piece about this is, is um, this is for kids at all grade levels. We're not saying it's just K3. So this would be an option then for our upper elementary kids too, that, um, that you know, we could maybe look at the KTA3 through MTSS, which is, a, which is above the state mandate, right? The state mandate is K3. This is helping us look at kids even above that. Yeah, I did not, I read that as just K3. That is correct. Yeah. That's why we wanted to give them this like a screener at um, third grade. Is there anything else above that one particular um, mandate that we're doing more than what the state besides the case of three? Um, part of the process? I'm not sure if I understand your question. Is there anything like doing above and beyond that we found in? in you being in the task group sort of from the research that we're doing above what the mandate is asking besides um, stretching it beyond third grade. Right? Um, I think in some yeah. of our other task groups. Yeah, yeah, other yeah. Groups. I think okay. you'll probably get that from the other folks. And I think that, you know, everybody's kind of doing something different in the pilot. Right. Um, they're, not everybody's doing the amount of screening that we're doing. So we're really trying to catch kids in many different ways. Um, I think that's been interesting about the pilot is looking at other school districts. Um, some of them are doing things different than us. And um, I think from what we've heard, we're doing, you know, um, some of the best work from this. To our own a little bit. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, we didn't have to do two, two screeners. Try to catch the students like you said at the granular level, but then also like a, a, a wider concept um, also. So. That's definitely something we're doing above. And, and that two screener really came from, I, I, I know because you have to have both right now, but the two screener really came from the fact that MAP um, at a younger age, we want to make sure we weren't missing people. That's why Pinot you know, Beat Cadence was added in because it's a little more focused, it's more specific, it's more granular. Um, but then we even found even with having two screeners, there could be still kids that are, aren't scoring low enough that we're missing. Do you know any of the other we do good. have a list um, from some of the meetings that we've gone to with the pilot districts and it, it, it lists, I, I don't have that on the top of my mind, what exactly everyone's doing. No one is doing, um, I can say for certain that no one is doing as much as we're doing. Um, however, I can't just off the top of my head recall exactly what. What is included in your package from the State Department of Education is a two-year implementation of all seven schools that participated in the pilot. Yes, ma'am, it's a dark blue document. Also in your folder is a copy of this um, slide presentation as well as a glossary. So I'm um, hoping those schools will be able to assist you at each year. We are mandated to submit um, a profile, and we do have a district profile that summarizes all of the practices for each pilot. It's not public facing at this point, but when it becomes public facing, we will share it with the board. 
quick question. I, I certainly appreciate that when we live in the state of Georgia, we're working within a Georgia pilot for this. Mm -hmm. But do we are we looking at other states and school systems like best in class? Does it exceptionally well? How do they screen? I mean, yes. Yeah. Yeah. With the task force, there's, there's other parts to this presentation, mm -hmm. but there is when we started our task force, then the Georgia Department of Education started a task force. Okay. So they're gathering all these findings and then they're having monthly meetings with us where they share what we're doing in addition to the research that they're doing in neighboring states and nationwide. We have the meetings every month with Dr. Liz Trump. Great. It, it's a work, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, this is new, right? So I know a lot of states are just getting onto this as well. So um, I know Texas has been doing it for a while. So we've been looking at them as well. One last thing I want to tell you all was that um, you know, of the children we do identify for the dyslexia screener, most of them have been identified for tier three support. So uh, we're doing that and we're, we're, looking, we're identifying characters with dyslexia. Um, the, the plan we have in place is scooping them up early. So I think really what our next job is to scoop up the ones that aren't being scooped up already through our university. I was going to ask, you don't know the number of the kids that we have that didn't both and so didn't move to so like, who maybe were identified on map but nailed yeah. Acadians and so were denied an additional screening or intervention? Yeah. Do you know the number of those students? I don't have it off the top of my head. We looked at it and it wasn't too high. Okay. Um, there were a couple. Like, yeah. There, there were a couple and some of them were like, you know, it's a gifted range. Um, we only tested 14, 23, 24 kids this year. Um, that's including the kids we tested and got screening consent for. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, I'm Carla Zizuk. I am a district reading coach for the, and I work primarily with the pre-K to second grade buildings. Um, it has been such a pleasure to be on the Dyslexia Task Force with um, some really amazing people who are out there doing the work. So it was it was really exciting to see the level of support that we have from our community. Um, to really move the needle for kids and help them become lifelong readers, and that's like my life. So <laughs> it's, it's been it's so exciting and fun. Um, and I think we have really amazing dialogue and conversation. And I love that. That's, that's really um, my jam. So my focus group, and some of my other friends are here. Just raise your hand if you're in the teacher learning work group club. No. <laughs> Well, so our, our real um, goal was to look at the professional learning that we currently have in place here in CSD and think about what we want to add and change and really, you know, analyze what's going on. And so one of my favorite outcomes of this is really kind of categorizing the different professional learning that we want to have and or currently have into two, these two different ways of thinking about it. Professional learning, that focuses on structured literacy foundational knowledge. So that's like what the teacher needs to know and understand about the theory, about the science of reading, about how it all works, how the reading brain works, all of these things. That is this piece. And then on the right, this is the like implementation of a particular program curriculum instructional framework. So we kind of split it up into these two different ways and thought about like, well, what do they, what, who has to have what? and how much and to what extent. Because we have a lot of different categories of teachers and a lot of different types of professional learning. And we wanna make sure that we're being as efficient and effective as possible and that people are really getting what they need to help kids. And um, I did wanna just point out that you have a glossary because all of these things, I know it's alphabet soup. Um, and I will touch on each of them a little bit, but your glossary does explain a little bit of what they are. Our key takeaway of the task force work group was that if we want to give students diagnostic, explicit, systematic, and cumulative reading instruction, our professional learning really has to be the same, right? We have to really be diagnostic, explicit, systematic, and cumulative with the adults in the building. And so that's what our goal really is. Okay, so just a little bit about what these Science of Reading course, that 
is an online asynchronous course in the science of reading recommended to us by the Skink School. It was rolled out this year. It was required <laughs> for teachers. Um, and there were touch points along the way with instructional coaches. This was really powerful. Um, we're going to continue to offer that to all new people. And then um, hopefully, well, I'll get to that in the next slide. Also, another foundational knowledge piece is the Georgia PSC offers a dyslexia endorsement. We have many teachers who have been interested and enrolled in that. Um, on the list, we have OG, 70 Hour. Our district offers that. You know, teachers just give up their time to participate in that. That's really uh, helpful for foundational knowledge. And then letters. So letters is a very involved PL program. It's a two-year commitment. And it has four full in-person days. And then basically like you know, the equivalent of maybe two master's level courses a year. And then there's exams that you take. So letters is really the gold standard of the PL that we are wanting some categories of our teachers to have. Okay, and then this side here is our specific programs and curriculum. We, have, we are PL, we are ID schools. There's professional learning there that does relate to literacy instruction, absolutely. Um, and then we have American Reading Company, that's our core reading program, that's knowledge building, reading and writing, full group and small group instruction in the classroom. We have ARC coaches that come and visit us <laughs> all year, um, once a month, and, and professional learning around that. And then Foundations. Foundations is our core phonics program, it's 30 minutes every single day. It is extremely, um, it takes a lot of skill to do foundations well, and that's something that we're, you know, a growth area, I think, for us. But we have been implementing foundations for years and still need to do it a little bit better of a job with it. Um, and then this other, this Wilson Reading System right here, this is something we're adding in. Wilson Reading System is made by the same people as Foundations, Barbara Wilson, her company, and that's going to be um, PL for special education and tier three intervention teachers for second through 12th grade students. This is a powerful program for kids who have maybe been resistant to remediation, like the really more complicated students who they got some tier two, they got some tier three, and then they're aging up. So I think this is going to be a great help for our secondary teachers, Wilson Reading System. And then Acadiance, you heard about Acadiance. We have data. We have to learn how to use it really effectively at the classroom level. So that's another PL goal. So if all of these things were in place, that would be amazing. And so some are and some aren't. So now I'm going to show you a little bit about, yeah? Mm -hmm. Do the teachers have to pay out of pocket for any of these? Um, professional development, I was wondering, like, specifically the uh, dyslexia endorsement. Um, I think they can choose to do it at, like, a private institution and pay for it, but the Georgia PSC one and, like, Metro Risa offers it, and they're free. Yeah. But I think if you, like, maybe wanted to do it at UGA or something, you, you might have to pay for it. But I bet you there's actually a occur that there is grant money for that. So you would just apply, like, if you wanted to do it at one of if you're not going to get into it, I'm interested in now. Which of these do we have financial or other incentives to do now? Ah, that's a great question. Um, so right now, are there financial incentives for any of these? No, okay. they're not for a teacher. No. Um, they do get a stipend for Wilson Reading System. It's their daily rate. So they're doing three days this summer. So they get their daily rate for those three days. Um, the rest, so, I mean, OG, some people view as a financial benefit if they choose to tutor privately, but that's not necessarily no, that's the case. I mean, that's not why they was, was your question whether they get paid to take the classes or whether there is some salary or compensation bonus if they've already gotten a certification? Both. So, yeah. so no. So the latter is no. The first doesn't have to be paid for. They don't have to pay to take them. Right. So they're all free. Or yes. mm -hmm. Adding some special education qualifications does increase salary, uh, but none of these qualify for that. So can we get an estimated budget impact if we were to ensure teachers were minimally paid for taking the actual classes? So if they put 
put 70 hours into OG, they get paid for those 70 hours? No, Pat, you're thinking, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I think, for instance, um, in other districts where people have completed letters training, they get, say, a $2,500 bonus one time, you know, for the two full years. Like, they get halfway, they get, like, whatever, half of it after the first year and the other half, and you have to pass it up. That's something, like in North Carolina, they did a full state. That's, that's high. That's big bucks. And some of that, too, is COVID money, right, which is, um, that's where all those stipends and training and things came up from. That's all COVID money that we don't necessarily um, currently have. So there, there's really my two questions, right? There's one that's like incentive compensation, which is what you're describing right there. I'm actually asking even more basically, if they're spending 20 hours a term to learn some of this stuff, that should not be 20 hours on their time. What what is yeah. the or can we what is the number if we were to pay for that twenty hours or whatever? So so I think that's a great question. Like say you wanted to give them their hourly rate, um, and it's something that came up and just kind of going off our script a little bit <laughs> that came up a lot in our task force is that something that teachers want is they want time to do the things. Except the problem is say we gave you a sub and then you left and you did your work on your letters and then. You know, then you went back, then that means your kids didn't get you, the teacher, that day. And so, you know, right now they get four days of the year that they can come out and do their, you know, in-person letters training. But if it was like, okay, so you worked on the, um, your OG training for 70 hours, so you get 70 hours of, like, classroom release time or something like that, then that's not really, I mean, that's, that's a hard decision to make. I think, like, it benefits, you know, I don't, I don't want to make that decision about it subs come and when they don't, but I definitely think that, you know, teachers like to have subs. They like to have the time in the work day and not outside of hours. Um, but then there's, you know, a trade-off with that. Probably can I interject? Please. And board, can I interject? For that type of monetary question, um, actually, we're excited to present to you all today so we can share our findings and recommendations, and so you can, in turn, share recommendations. And I know that we're in a season of change, so we also have to represent this presentation based on the recommendations. And our department would have to speak to whoever's over that decision regarding the budget increases or decreases and how we would move forward. So the district instructional coaches really can speak to anything monetarily today out of all the respect. Okay. There, there is a very polite way of telling me to something. <laughs> 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 that has some of the financial on it. We did do research and gather the cost of the courses, and it's in there. It's not part of our presentation today, but you do have that information, right? Like the slides that we're not showing. Sure. So, yeah, but we'll keep it moving. That's what Corby's saying. Round it up. Okay. Um, so another thing is this is like our goal. This is what we wish was happening here in Decatur. And so like that 100% of our teachers would have basic structured literacy foundational knowledge and they would all have curriculum basic set and assessment professional learning, right? And then you can kind of see it changes based on the role. Like for instance, do all K-12 EIP teachers need all of these things? Yes, they need these. Um, but, you know, Paris could opt in. And then right here, this advanced, that's sort of like the OG 70 hour, the letters, these are the things that are advanced, or like it's more of an opt-in. But there are some basics that we want everyone to have. Um, and then this fourth column is really crucial because not only do they need to have the learning, but then they have to do it. You have to demonstrate. You have to do the thing that you were just taught how to do. So this 85% is like a, um, a realistic percentage of how people would actually be, you know, like say you have a new teacher. She, she or he has the training, but they're just still learning how to do it, so that might not always be at 100%. Or right? people are learning things. So that's what this is about. This is what we want, okay? Keep that in your mind. And then right here, this is where we are. 
so there's still more red on here. Um, I think one of the things we did discover is how proud we should be of our work with the Health Science and Reading course. That was actually a lot of learning that people did in their buildings. Um, teachers said had really rave reviews about it, and that they they learned so much more about the science of reading than they than they knew going into it. Even people who were reading specialists and had done OT, they still really enjoyed this course, and it was a good bit of work. We even had 13 parents do it. They didn't have to. They didn't get compensated to do it, but they just chose to, which is really awesome. Our K-5 paras are um, so invested <laughs> in um, helping kids read. And, and they do end up working with students in small groups all the time. So that was exciting. Um, next is foundations, the second column. So as I mentioned, that's our core clinics program. 82% of our dentist teachers participated in a launch workshop. That's a full day training on your grade level. Um, that happened, but we still have new people who have joined us since that happened. So they'll be being onboarded. And now um, I am a facilitator, Jill Tolsma at Glenwood is a facilitator, Amelia Kopp is an intervention person, and Gail's becoming a facilitator for third grade and just words. And so now we'll be able to do that PL in house. We won't have to pay for these individual people to go into the Foundations Launch Workshop. So that's awesome. And then you can see EIP and special ed, the numbers are a little bit lower there. And so that's another area of growth for us, we found. That like, oh wait, they, they have to be brought in so that they know what's happening in the gen ed classroom with phonics instruction. Instructional coaches have it. Um, our principals attended the literacy leadership that we, um, foundations came here, this school year over here, and we had principals involved in that, which was um, really helpful for them to understand what was going on. That and then the so third district reading coaches. <laughs> I've done the foundation sponsor workshop. And then here we have letters. And so, it's a, as I said, it's a two year cohort. Very few of our gen ed teachers have participated in letters training, uh, 2%. So, we would really like to move that number. However, this is an advanced structured literacy PL. So, this is more where we want to see this happening over here in the EIP special ed and instructional coaches. These are the people who are really working with students who might need additional support and remediation. So while we would, it's a lot love to have for dentist teachers, like our real first priority are the people who are working with struggling readers. And this summer, we have our school leaders, like the principals and APs, and all of our district leaders participating in letters for us. It went very exciting. Um, they also, just as a side note, are participating in an OG course for admin as well this summer. So that's great news. And you can see here too, we have more of our teachers, dentist teachers who have been OG, 34%. Um, again, offering summer OG with school and done. And so, like, they have some seats for our teachers at their OG training. And we kind of like flip flop seats. So that we can share the cost of the OT courses. Um, and again, we had a pair. We've had a pair who's been trained in OT, which is so nice. Um, and then you can see here to EIP special ed instructional coaches. These are areas of growth for us. Any questions about that? I'm surprised that the OG numbers are so much higher than the letters. Is that just because OG is well, so, that, okay. I mean, there's probably a lot of different reasons. People who do like to pursue OG because of the additional income source you might have okay. um, tutoring students privately. Okay. And um, I don't know that that's necessarily the case for letters, although it certainly does work in a tutoring setting, but OG is really designed for that. So maybe that's why. I don't know why else. I was just going to say that um, letters is more of a professional learning, yeah. and OG is more of a method of of sure. what I'm going to do. So for a teacher who's choosing both, they're going to say, well, letters is a two-year commitment, mm -hmm. okay, and then not only am I going to go to those classes uh, four times a year, I also have 60 to 80 hours outside of the classroom that I have to do work. It's like, like Carla said, it's like two master's classes, yeah. uh, like college classes. I'm, I'm a district facilitator for letters this year, mm -hmm. and so that training I'm offering the teachers. And then for OG, it's different. 
OG isn't something that our district is mandating. OG is not something that we are standing behind. It's saying, there's nothing, we're not standing behind it, but we write grants for that, right? Yeah. With letters, it's different. So that's the difference. Okay. And actually, so Gail is a one through four letters facilitator and is becoming a five through eight facilitator. And then by the end of this year, I'll be a one through four facilitator. So that's immensely helpful in terms of cost. Do these things in house. There's still fees associated with using the materials and the training that we have to do, sure. but it's certainly less expensive than having letters people come here and do that. We mentioned that those are areas of growth, so if you might have this in the next slide, but do you have suggestions on how we can? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do. So this is our rollout. So um, I think our first priority when we looked at those red areas is really to get foundations implementation with fidelity in every classroom, K3. So that means that, one, we should have 100% of our teachers having the launch workshop for the grade that they are teaching, right? We've had great changes, new people, and so on. Um, and then two, as I mentioned before, foundations requires a good deal of skill and practice the things you learned in OG, so you know, foundations is based in OG principles, and it's all connected with letters and science of reading. They all go together, and so you really have to have a deep understanding of all of those different theories and research and all of the good stuff to do foundations well. And so our plan this year as part of our professional learning is to really um, increase the amount of study groups that we have for foundations modeling. Glenwood has become a foundation site school. That was part of my facilitator training. And so then we'll be actually going to Glenwood and seeing model classes there and just really diving in and really making sure that our foundation construction is awesome and amazing. Um, second, Letters for Leaders, I did mention that they are doing that this summer. So that's very exciting. Um, and then a, the, the, the third bullet point, I think, was one of my most exciting takeaways from our dyslexia task force is to have all the instructional coaches take the letters one through four this year and then five through eight this year. Um, because when they have that understanding, it will help them in all of their coaching with teachers. Okay, and then I did mention Wilson Reading System, grades two through 12. EIP teachers and special education teachers will be offered that course this summer. They do get their daily rate. It still is a big lift, a big ask of those teachers for their last three days of summer. Uh, so we're hopeful that people will participate. Um, and then last, so the same people who have been offered Wilson Reading System, EIP and Special Ed, those are the same group. And they do really need a high level of advanced knowledge. Um, and so we want them to, to participate in letter training, but we thought, Maybe not the same year as you do your Wilson reading system. Maybe wait a year. So those are our big rollout recommendations. You know, the same concerns that you had about teacher time and stipends and things like that are the same ones we did too. But um, fortunately, we have so many educators who have chosen to pursue these different professional learning experiences just on their own out of love and excitement and enthusiasm for literacy. And so um, I am very hopeful. There, any questions about this? I think I know you did this earlier, but the letters training, I'm looking specifically at the EIP and special ed teachers, that's for first through eighth grade? Letters is K-12. It's really just like background. So Wilson, wait, did you say Wilson reading? No, I found letters. Yeah, letters is all like how literacy happens for humans. That works for everybody. Yeah. What were you saying then about the instructional coaches doing three K three and then five eight training. Oh. oh, those are the modules of letters. Got it. Okay. One through four is the first year, and five through eight is the second year. Thank you. I got confused on that. Okay. And it's what I'm hearing here is that one of the major barriers as to why we're in the red here is some of it is budget, but a lot of it's time. So figuring out a way to do this. Second question is um, triage. You have to triage. When would we consider a offering some 
talking into a computer, as, as you mentioned, they are doing professional mm -hmm. ones there. Well, so that's a great question. We currently do host, Gail is host the um, para-literacy training, and she does it once a month. And we cover different topics like foundations. It's a little more like high-level overview. Um, but, you know, because of the way they're paid and their time, asking them to do like full days is tricky. Um, but they were willing to come for these little 45 minute after school things um, that we did for that Gail does virtually. They are definitely willing to come. So, you know, they might it might they might be in the car listening to it um, on the way or walking their dog once they get home. But for the most part, um, the parents were very happy to participate in the um, literacy training. So we talked about our you know, because now ARC is going to be in our district and you're going to have these students in your classroom. What do I do with them, right? What does small groups look like? What does writing look like? What's me working with you? We talked about foundations. We talked about um, reading one on one or writing one of conferences. Just things that have to do with the ELA classroom. And within those meetings, we had at least one or two parents that were so excited. And you saw that um, one of them finished this letter training. I mean, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. She did that because she wanted to. And it was so much fun talking to her and helping her, you know, move professionally um, just out of the love of children. So. Yeah, and, you know, I do think what is super powerful for paras is to have a, a cooperating teacher who is a model of excellence. And so then, you know, it's easy for a teacher who is really confident and understands what they're doing say like, okay, you're going to do this part, I'm going to do this part, you know, and um, making sure that that teacher is really an expert. Come under, just already done, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So when you say roll out, what's the... So adding the instructional coaches. Okay, so that's right? new. That's new. This, we, was like happening at the same time as the dyslexia task force, essentially. So like, be honest, I knew what the task force, yeah. <laughs> like as I was on this group, and we were all sort of in conversations yeah. about what do we want to have for the summer and for next year, and we we saw these ideas, and we're like, yes, this this aligns with what the work is that's happening in our district. This is great. This okay, supports what we want to do, and so we're heading in this direction. And the task force had very similar recommendations, so it's perfect. I did I do think this one though about the instructional coaches. 100% of them having letters, that's a great addition. Okay. Yeah, because I was just reviewing the mid-year stuff, and right. that's almost worked toward what it was in December, so I was just looking for a new coaches and then a general theme, of, and we've got to incentivize this happening quicker. Yeah, and also, the, I think, the, I don't know if the lesson reading system was... Oh, I mean, as of that's last Friday, as of last Friday, letters for principals was just approved oh, that was after three o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> and same thing with um, the Wilson reading system. Okay. And we're still recruiting people. So okay. So they're new ish, but yeah, yeah, also no, very no, organically out of what's been in the work. And the Wilson reading and training and recruitment <laughs> is one of the budget requests that came to the budget oh. for 2024. Right. So once okay. that was tentatively approved by the board at the last right. meeting, we're able to move it forward. Yes, and okay. I actually had written down to also thank you tentatively for your tentative. <laughs> 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 yeah. On the foundation of the location we can do in every class building in every classroom as well or is that also kind of new so, level of we have been teaching foundations for many years mm -hmm. in our district. Mm -hmm. In 2014, and just this year, we're establishing a foundation, a foundation site demonstration site school. That's the proper word for it, and that's new. So we can uh, train our own trainers, and that's what Carla mentioned. She, the instructional coach um, from Glenwood, is participating in that certification as well as an. EIP teacher, and they're almost done with their year one training. With the oh, I'm actually in it. Congratulations. <laughs> with the support of Wilson Reading. So, so when we say we want everybody to do it to an 85%, you know, across the system, we want to yeah. do an 85%. Are we tracking what percentage we're at 
now or that's going to be what we so that's to? really what we focus on that that will be what my a lot of my work is next year okay. mm -hmm. um so we're doing it fidelity would is my hope mm -hmm. it, not my hope that's my goal yeah, that's and so i think um it will take um, but we have a really strong plan of what those PL sessions are going to look like and how we're going to use our site school and how Jill and Amelia and I are going to do these launch workshops. And so I think um, it will be very successful with, with a, a lot of support from our school too, you know, because we have so many skilled teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's kind of a matter of helping all the amazing scientists. I, I love to hear the thoughts from the rest of the board, but I do I do think that metric in particular, the fact that it's actually being used in the classroom, I'd, I'd love to see that pop up to one of the dashboards that we do as a part of the strategic. I know we have oh, a dashboards, yeah. but I would that just feels like something that that That's tracking awesome. them. Yeah. Also, the the. Um, District reading coach for third through fifth grade. Gail is getting training in foundations as well, and the instructional coaches from the three five schools are getting training next year. Thank you, Carla. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Well, the good news is you're on the downhill slide. You've done all the heavy lifting already. Um, I'm Patty Nation Fornwall. Um, and first, Dr. Furman, thank you for hearing the parent concerns and inviting us to be part of this task force. Um, we really appreciate it. We appreciate being part of the work and hopefully part of the solution to make um, literacy uh, better um, than we are today um, in the future. So, um, and I want to thank Courtney, who was our very able um, and wonderful work group leader. Um, and then Laura and Sarah and I provided the parents input. So am I supposed to advance these slides? Okay. okay. So our recommendations are primarily around um, improving um, the amount of information, getting more information, making it more intuitive and easy to find and more accessible. So the major focus is on revamping the dyslexia resources um, and the web page um, on the CSD website. Um, this is kind of a mock-up. It's modeled after the Department of Education website um, with lots of buttons and links to um, make things easy to find. So um, our primary our, there we go. Our primary um, recommendation is to relocate this from where it is today. It's under MTSS. And most people are not going to think to look under MTSS for reading or dyslexia resources, right? Even though those two things are very tightly coupled. Um, so we suggest moving it to um, English language arts. It's under the teaching department. It's where people would expect to find something about reading. Um, and then we want um, to include things about general struggling reader uh, information. What is dyslexia? What is not? Um, what are indicators based on age and grade, um, some of those quick links to internal things like MTSS, um, as well as maybe our pilot um, results and information from those types of things, and then external sources, so the state bill, um, the Senate Bill 48, um, Decoding Dyslexia Georgia, IDA, the Dyslexia Handbook that the state has put together. Um, and we want to use kind of more graphics whenever we can than words, um, because as you guys had all those questions and listened to what Ben um, and folks presented about the screeners, that's a complicated process, or at least it seems like it, right? I have some flow charts and make it simple and easy to understand of when to expect this happens or that happens and where do you go from there? So providing those graphics instead of a bunch of pages of words that you have to scroll down um, and then links to other areas. And then the other big piece is um, frequently asked questions. And much to Courtney's dismay probably, the three of us uh, brought to the table about seven pages of single space que questions mm -hmm. that we were proposing be included in the frequently asked questions. Um, we understand that's a heavy lift. 
Um, actually, a lot of those things I think we have answers for already. They're just spread out all over the website, um, and they're not accessible and easy to find. So gathering all that information, putting it into a document that's um, structured in a way that's easy to get to. So using links into big categories like general literacy, dyslexia, the screeners, struggling readers, where might I find this information about MTSS or external evaluation? Um, and so that you can jump into that document kind of right in that area and find what you want. So that's kind of what we want to do. And then obviously doing all that fabulous work, we need to communicate that out. So we are hoping, um, I understand that there's a resource available to do some website work, so we're hoping that it could get launched this summer. So launch that in July before school starts. Um, and then August, September, um, you have a couple of opportunities at curriculum nights to talk about this. Um, that's when the uh, beginning of your screeners would be happening, so communications to parents about that. October is Dyslexia Awareness Month, so activities for that and then use that as a launch pad to encourage all principals, um, not just K3 or K5, to talk about struggling readers and dyslexia and take um, a coffee chat time to do that sometime through the rest of the year. And then mid-year, November, actually all of these bullet points on the bottom are kind of associated with when the screeners might be happening. Um, and it's opportunities to connect with parents and talk about that and explain the results. Um, February is Dyslexia Month, um, Dyslexia Day at the State Capitol. Um, Courtney went this year, and you can meet legislators and other advocates and get your picture taken on step. Um, but it's a lot of great information there as well. And then kind of wrapping up May with um, an opportunity to talk um, at K-Day for incoming parents. It would be huge. Um, obviously, the end-of-year screeners and then going into summer with a summer reading list and information about resources for that for summer. So um, a lot um, less involved than the other two areas, but equally as important. Um, any questions? Yeah, could we um, jump back to the first page of the Maybe. answer? Yeah. <laughs> um, one thing that really, the, one more. Yeah. Um, there we go. Oh, no, no, there this, we go. this one, yeah. okay. One thing that really jumped out at me, and I and I want to make sure we don't lose sight of it, is that advocacy information. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's been a little while since I've engaged with it, but having this conversation on everything now um, is uh, it's not just like what forms are necessary or what phone numbers there are. It's not really the what; it's the how to advocate. Mm -hmm. Like. Here's what needs to happen now. Here's the forms that have to be filled out. Here's what the doctors have to say. Here's what the the, the assessments have to say. Like that, really spelling it out in a way that I mean, y'all y'all have been advocating for this for so long, and I suspect you've probably forgotten more about it. <laughs> most parents will will know. So really laying that out in kind of a, a process that mm -hmm. a parent can follow, I think, would be incredibly powerful and and yeah, I'm suspecting y'all are thinking about it this way, but just what would you have wanted when you started the process? Yeah. Right? And, and I think that'll be hugely beneficial for parents. Thank you, Patty. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, um, I just want to again um, ask everyone to thank the Dyslexia Task Force members. They did such a wonderful job on taking a very unbiased look at what we have in place what we need to improve to make sure that we are supporting our students that are struggling readers to make sure that we are going to meet that goal of every student being a skilled reader by the end of third grade. So the next step is, um, the, you know, the school-based staff will take a look at all of these recommendations, um, prepare an executive summary that will be presented to the board at the May 9th board meeting with the recommendations that we think are tenable for the, for the upcoming year and kind of a calendar out of what is coming next based on We've heard so um, it is it's great it's good information and um, now it's okay how do we implement those recommendations and make sure it aligns with the active view of reading that we use in city schools of Decatur so again I just want to thank the team for their work it brought forth things that we didn't think were going to be issues and let us see that they are so that we can improve our work as a school system so thank you all thank you Beth.
Yeah. I mean, can we just acknowledge the other team members who are in the audience? Sure, yeah. Do you have the passport for my yeah. I just want to acknowledge you and thank you for your work. Um, our next presentation is Ohio River South. Um, they are here to present a summary of the legislative session. Like jump right in. Just jump right in. Okay. Um, so we outlined uh, about six different bills that kind of were on the top of the agenda. Now. Mind you, somewhere between 30 to 40 percent of all of the bills dropped every year in the legislature touch education in some way, shape, or form. So we have a track and sheet total combined that definitely has much more questions about and uh, had the most interest in it because they affected your school system um, the most. Oh, so, okay. yeah. I've met you virtually, but. Yes. <laughs> so I know, I actually, Howard said this too. We put our personal slide at the bottom of the list. Oh. So um, I should have bumped it back up next time. But uh, so Howard had to step out to take a call. He's our CEO and founder, Howard Franklin. Um, Jennifer LaRosa uh, leads a team at the state capitol. And I'm DJ Myers. I'm the deputy director of campaigns and advocacy. Yeah, DJ was a huge right hand to a lot of your issues and walking some of us to um, different legislator meetings for those of you that did come up to the Capitol this year. So uh, what's next after session ends? Immediately after, we have 40 business days, unlike our legislative days. The governor has time to veto, sign, or not do anything, and it automatically becomes law. Uh, where we stand right now, um, typically, he doesn't really sign anything unless a group asks him to to become it very ceremonial. Otherwise, he'll just let it pass through and become law. Uh, veto is much more um, what gets attention. So right now, as of right now, HB 319, which would have uh, required all the university systems in Georgia to um, get approval from the legislature to increase their tuition, uh, was vetoed. Now, we do know that there are rising costs in tuition each year, for that matter, and then uh, with Hope Scholarship being a pretty large bucket of money that's being utilized and that's being depleted, we're trying to find new funding mechanisms. Do these things have anything to do with each other? I don't know. Um, but we do know, I think the governor really wanted to give the universities a chance to uh, touch on this one, so he did veto that one. So get into the legislation. We did the ones that passed first, and the first two on the list we're very excited about, uh, which were your pieces of legislation. The first one was basically a reinforcement changing the lines to match the new state lines after the uh, reinforcement statewide, and it passed both chambers, no questions asked. The next one is the senior homestead exemption, which we did get a five-year extension on that, that piece of legislation, uh, and you see the details here with the 200000 assessment value, the age range, and then not to exceed the 62000 And we have um, questions we can ask at the end. This was an interesting one. It did get a lot of attention, um, and I, would, I have talked to many legislators since then with the time to have some discussions and other uh, charter school systems and lawyers that help those systems just to be sure what this would and would not do. And I have been told uh, repeatedly that with the resources that we share with the State Board of Education, they wanted to create a department, if you will, that catered to charter school system issues specifically. So it is not another layer of bureaucracy, but supposed to be a go-to resource that's a little bit more direct for the things that you guys have to do. A time frame for that commission being up and running? Remember? That's a great question. We can actually look that up. There'll probably be like a um, institution date. We meant to ask questions to the beginning to what this bill actually was. Yes, good point. We've actually we we asked two different legislators. One of them being the champion of this bill, and he was like, I don't know. So um, yeah, I'll look and I'll look at it through. Do you want to just look that up, Bill? Real quick, see if it has a date. Uh, so that's what, a pretty easy one to answer. Yeah, what, what their actual charter is. Might you don't have to do it now, but if there's... Yeah, yeah. It might be on the website, which would be an easy one to find. Yeah. Okay, so this one looks similar to another bill we really didn't like. 
but it, uh, this is already a law. It has some tweaks to that law that really weren't very large. The chunk of the newness to this particular measure was uh, creating some boundaries around the tuition amount that could be charged when a student was completely virtual. Uh, so it didn't pass. It stayed, it got tabled in the Senate, and had it not, it would not have had enough time to even make it through the House process when it finally got there. This bill also, uh, should rewind a bit, what happens next year is also a question we should have discussed, which is all bills are live. It's the beginning of the biennial. I'm sure you guys already know most of this, but anything that did not pass this year is exactly where it was now next year. It'll be in the chamber that it currently is. So if it passed the House, it'll be in the Senate committee it was assigned to and vice versa. If it didn't even make it out of its original chamber, it'll just be back in that committee. So this bill is important for a few reasons. One, the champion of the bill, the main signer, is the governor's floor leader. So this is a governor initiative. The fact that it didn't pass is interesting. And um, so we should see this one pop back up next year because uh, most of the governor's stuff does eventually pass. So we'll keep an eye out for that one, but it'll just go back to the Senate Education Committee for now. This one, uh, we know it's the governor's initiative to increase teacher pay. Um, I think that this one was somewhat of a, a way to at least get some attention for teachers that had a little bit more education in some way, shape, or form than some others, perhaps. So it, it specifically uh, required a bachelor's degree for that increase, but it did not pass either. It did even make that a Senate committee. There we go. Thanks. Uh, and then the last one. I think that I was live texting some of you <laughs> through the night when this one passed pretty late in the evening, or it did not pass pretty late in the evening. I will say that the language did change from the Senate to the House, so the House increased the six to 6,500 um, for the QBE formula. A few things that would happen, let's say this comes up again next year, for instance. Um, a few things that would have to happen if this bill ever passed completely. Uh, QBE had to be funded fully, which they did pass this year. Uh, they have to, the people, legislators that want this, have to lobby the appropriation process, so the other legislators that have control over the state funding, to create this bucket of money for this to happen. You have, uh, and another thing that changed from Senate to House is a school cannot have children removed, per se, unless they were on the list for two years consecutively, not the first year. So there were some changes uh, to the better, although not that this bill is fabulous, um, in this, the House, and so we we did get some feedback, and you know the governor was in the paper supporting this initiative, and it came up the very next day to be voted on, which happened to be the last day of session. We thought it was going to be a different uh, vote. We were a little bit concerned about that, so to see this result, and so closely, um, there was there was an emotional reaction in the chamber, if you were watching. So we will keep an eye out for it next year. I think that we've been given an opportunity to discuss that it may change this whole conversation, uh, because then if we do change that funding mechanism that hasn't been changed in, I think, 40 years or so, then will they want to completely fund it for this to even trigger? So we're going to have a lot of conversations around that in the off season with um, Todd Jones, who is uh, was education appropriations chairman and very involved in the health side of the, this measure. Um, so some of the things we mentioned that we'll uh, kind of go over to do in summer and fall uh, is really foster those relationships with our delegation. We have new delegation members. We have uh, changes in leadership in the board and at the school level and or uh, system level and I think it's a good idea that we have some conversations with them. Multiple of them have approached us to come tour the schools, read books for the kids, and be engaged a little bit more in the different systems. So we might want to reach out to them or come here and be a part of some of your board conversations. So reach out to them and give them that opportunity. We have shared the board meeting schedule uh, so they can come whenever. Um, and some other things is have those QBE conversations 
formula, uh, formula conversations with some stakeholders. And then um, you guys are one of the top systems in the state. Um, we should be a voice of information um, in practice for some of the other school systems in any way, shape, or form that they might need. And so there's some areas and topics and places that I think that we can fit you guys into those conversations too that we would like to do. What would be great is to help us put together what our particular, you know, like if, if somebody called me right now and asked me to give them a primer on the GE funding formula update, I'd be like, it's not good. But I, I, you know what I mean? It would be helpful to have, and James, I think you're pretty savvy about it. It would be helpful to have kind of a clear policy position that they leads to around some of these core issues. I think that's more for us than it is for them, largely. Uh, Jennifer did do me a favor of suggesting a sit down with Todd Jones, who was the appropriation educator and a big component of vouchers and someone with who seems reasonable, though I disagree with almost everything. He's probably a Braves fan too, or something like that, maybe all we have in common. Um, but it was a great conversation. He did say that they were up for revisiting the QBE, kind of uh, wanted to put up, he, he suggested a stakeholder group that is a personal reference to like governor's legislative person, Senator Parent's name what came up, something like that, and just kind of start that conversation. That is it. That's the entirety of where we got, other than I was shocked at how willing he was to visit. If we wanted to come up to speed on some of these core issues, what would be the best way? I mean, Dr. Furman is probably the one who's most awfully spoke compassion about how the QBE formula for several different areas is grossly underfunded. Um, she sent me, it must have been two years ago, the literature on like subs or whatever it's like, yeah. but I think it's like $20 a day. I mean, it is great. Nurses, I think, are like $20,000. And I think that's the best way to attack the QBE formula is to find one area. Like, hey, let's raise the not the funding we get for bus drivers. Let's raise the funding that you're allotting. That was the bill this year, too. Nurses. So that, that, I think, is the most effective way mm -hmm. to start addressing. They're not going to do a whole you know, reboot of the QBE formula, I think anytime soon, but I think finding particular things that are pain points for schools, transportation, nurses, counselors was one that they did address this year um, in a little bit, but I think that, to me, that's the way to, and then gather support with fellow districts and neighbors and say, hey, let's all go down and make this a unified effort. Like this year, we need more money for transportation. I think that's the way to do it. One thing I do want to think, uh, raise to your attention is I found out that they are trying to remove the requirement for teacher certification of a DEI course. So everyone going through teacher training programs, teacher prep programs, is required to take a diversity, equity, and inclusion course as part of their course requirements. The PSD is trying to get that very quietly taken out of teacher prep programs. And I think that I think they're having some hearings. I'll try to see if I can find the information. Um, either tomorrow or sometime later this week, but I think that is another way they're trying to undermine the equity work in our state by quietly removing those things from our teacher prep program. So I'll send you that info because I think that's something if we can get, you know, some voice for that, that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so the answer to when the Charter Commission uh, is completed is not in the legislation itself, so stand by. Okay. We'll find that out. Um, any other questions about any legislation we've mentioned today, the process? All right. Well, that's who we are. <laughs> and just, just so you know, I mean, this isn't the only, this is the le part of the legislative team. We actually had six or seven people from our team down there. Here's some of us, uh, or actually this is the whole team right now. Um, our firm does a ton of different things, just to give you a little bit of an idea. Um, we do, like DJ said, he does campaigns and advocacy, so we do advocacy campaigns for different groups. We do um, school board, state level, local level campaigns for different folks, individuals. Different cam uh, communication campaigns, whether it's crisis campaigns, outreach for SWAT, and everything else. So this is the whole team. If there's ever any need anywhere else, we're here to help you. Uh, but just so you know, we'll keep our tracking system stays in place annually. So everything that we have right now will stay just as it is until we move into next year and we start picking up new items and those will start to move. 
wonderful. I, we really, I know, I appreciated having you guys. It truly was a pleasure, and um, yes, it was an experience I won't forget, and I look forward to continuing the good work we certainly put some sweat and tears into this year, so um, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and we already have the answer. Okay. Right? Unless you want to hear directly, then it's up to you as the chair. So they just want to give me the screener data now, publicly? Is that what you want to do, Megan? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll make it really quick. So Dr. Well, Bean, I'm sorry, James, are you okay with that? Yeah, that's okay. fine. Come Thank on. You. Um, Dr. Bean has shared, I was, hi, Megan, doing a lot of on the screening working group with these fabulous people. Okay. And um, you're just answering the question, how many yeah. kids with the doing the screening? You had a great yeah. question about how many kids we might potentially be missing based on map growth yep. and the caveats, having that requirement be and, that they needed to be below a certain benchmark on both. Yeah. And so Dr. Beam had shared some data with us. This is for the 2021-22 school year because that was the full complete year that we had. Now, these are the numbers of children who were screened because they were below benchmark on both, so okay. they did receive the KTEA. Okay. In all of kindergarten, three students. In all of first grade, nine students. In all of second grade, 25 students. In all of third grade, two students. This is the percentage of students who were below benchmark on Acadians at the end of the year. Kindergarten, 28% of our kindergartners were below benchmark. You gave me two Acadia. different data, though. You gave me raw numbers on the first one. And then... This is the data that Chris, Dr. Beam had shared with us okay. in that format, so I apologize that I don't have. That's okay. Three is a very low yeah. percentage. Two, I mean, given that we had a couple hundred kindergartners, you would expect 40 or 50 kids. I think I actually do have it broken down in the percentages if you want me to find it. Um, but at the end of the year, yeah. and 20% of our second graders were below benchmark on the end of the year for Acadians. Now, we don't have percentages for third graders because they don't take Acadians in third grade, which is why all of this data helped inform our recommendation that we should have on these two screeners and not require it to be both, and also that map growth that grows as a reading screener. It may have other fine qualities for national norms and percentiles, but only one out of five sections on that growth is looking at those foundational reading skills that are predictive of future reading struggles. And so therefore, as Ben pointed out, you may have children who are above that 20th percentile on that, but below benchmark on Acadians. Therefore, they're not getting the further screening. Is and that the typical direction? Like the Acadians would be low, MAP would be high? And the typical direction is the kid's going to be caught by Acadians because that is looking at those essential early literacy skills and they are going to be above 20th percentile on MAP. Okay. Which is right. part of our informed our recommendations for going with a better screener instead of MAP growth as a dyslexia screener using MAP reading fluency dyslexia screener because it does look at those vital early literacy skills that are predictive of later success or failure. Okay, thank you. And, and I'll email that to you all as well just so you can look at it because I know it's hard to just. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Uh, so just quick back, this should be about 300 second graders, is that right? No, a lot more, a lot less. Uh, 300 total second graders? Yeah. I think about, yes. Okay. Uh, I'm just trying to do it's math not, it's here. Like three. Like how many second graders are there in the system? I, mean, I know how many there are. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, these numbers are basically in order of magnitude. But if I can just clarify, because I, I sometimes I get confused. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, I think so what I did here was that although there are some deficiencies or some holes with math, and every test has some deficiencies. If, if we use, if we were to say math is no good and not do it, then we would be also throwing away some of the other things other than other than dyslexia right. screening that it does track over time. Right. So that's kind of the, the trick. 
trade off. Yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. That's, 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 that's what I. And we need to get math for more than just. Right. 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 We got to get math for. Because I feel like sometimes when we have this conversation, the math stuff comes under fire. Mm -hmm. And it has, although it, it clearly has some old suspicions, there's some other things that it's bring before. Right? I, I, wait, the, re the recommendation is math growth stays for what it's good at. It's no longer a dyslexia screener. Math no. growth does what it does. Math reading and fluency becomes our new additional screener along with the cadence for what we are looking at in terms of dyslexia. But that was what, what I heard. already doing, math and cadence? But we don't do the math dyslexia screener. Math, 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 math has a math separate dyslexia. dyslexia. Those three. So there's math reading, then there's math dyslexia, and then there's a cadence. So now, so you make it the complete <laughs> well, and we're also evaluating, is there a better assessment than math? Um, so we, we are looking at a better assessment than math. Math takes a long time, so we're looking at evaluating STAR as an alternative for MAP Universal Screener. It's a shorter assessment. It's, we can give it K-12, um, so we are looking at changing what we've used for Universal Screeners. Um, the data is a little easier for our teachers to use. Um, so we may not be using math just because it might be time to change our universal screeners, but the dyslexia screener just dyslexia. That would be an addition to the math screener. Right. 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 To whatever regular universal screeners we use. And we have to universal, this is a requirement from the state, we have to universally screen students on reading and math um, twice a year or three times a year. Twice a year, at least twice a year. We do it three, but I think the requirement is twice. So that's a separate, that's a completely separate thing. And now dyslexia, the Senate bill is that bill is saying we have to now screen in addition to that dyslexia. So if we add that, like you were a first grader, would you take that same date? No, 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 no. We calendar it out. The hope would be is you do the reading fluency instead of the vocabulary. You could do one or the other, right? You could do the reading fluency, so you're screening for granular skills rather than the large comprehension skills, or you could do that. But you want to keep the math growth for third and up because we talk about these other screeners. That's predicted that's your mouse as well, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure you have that data because that predicts how you do it. So, so K2 is math, reading, and fluency. And Acadian. Mm -hmm. Free and up, we're going to keep map growth but might use STAR, and we will still have map reading and fluency and Acadian as dyslexia screeners. Map growth or STAR is the more universal screener for Well, that's their recommendation, and that's what we right. yeah, yeah, right. back and evaluate. Mm -hmm. Is that the best? Yeah. Um, but we don't currently use STAR as universal we use, Not for universal, we do with the high school. Yeah, high school switched from MAP to STAR because it was better instructionally for them and was able to do K uh, 9 through 12. Yeah, they changed this year for okay. STAR at the high school. Because when I was, when I was still there, probably not the press pro, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought we, they used STAR, STAR for MTSS. Data and my question, because I think it's an important one, is currently you have to be below a benchmark on both to get additional. That identified 25 second graders when we made this change to or, not and. I think that that would have been about 50 second graders, and those numbers are just like call me out on that or whatever. And that's the best in this case. So, just that would have qualified for the case. Yeah. If it is in or, right. not an and. Right. And then the follow-up question is to that is once they took the KPA, what did you find? Right, right. We have to look at the data. That for the most part, there's a range, so we have to look. You know, there's different scores. I think four, so it could be anywhere from like 90 to 70 risk. So we have to look. We want to look at the kids at the school of 85. We want to look at the scores. Of that, that we can get for you. Yeah, I guess my question would be when you change that metric to four, and I'm not saying that I'm opposed to that, I think it's reasonable to change that to 
or then you had a larger group that went into that screening pool, that KPEA, and then, then what? So then did you find, well, gosh, you know, we actually caught 100 kids that we were missing instead of, you know, 25, or did you find it was actually the same? Because then, you know, if you're talking about adding potentially a third test or changing a test, the question is, can it stay is it worth it? Mm -hmm. um, cost, the time, all of that, that's, if that, if that question makes sense. And we can review that as part of our kind of final team. Mm -hmm. And it is two tests. You have to add the read fluency, then you have to add the structure. Read fluency doesn't come with it. There would be two more. Please be a gentleman this evening. Excellent. Any other questions? All right, we are adjourned.